It was the late 2000s. The Pokemon series was on its fourth generation, and the first one on Nintendo's new handheld, the Nintendo DS. The franchise's new entries had once again been critical and commercial success, with the game's Pokemon Diamond and Pearl selling over 4 million copies during its launch year in 2007, becoming the fastest selling games in the franchise thus far. But it wasn't quite perfect. The games were very slow, the choices for Pokemon in the region Pokedex were lacking, and the story was very basic. But the savior of these problems, and more, arrived on May 22, 2009, when the Pokemon game changed forever. Okay, obviously I'm exaggerating a bit, but Pokemon Platinum is just that good. The fourth generation of Pokemon is very close to my heart producing some of the best games in the series even outside of Platinum, but I feel like this, THIS, was the moment Pokemon truly became one of THE best games of all time. The previous games, Red, Blue and Yellow, Gold, Silver and Crystal, and Ruby, Sapphire and Emerald, were more than passable games, but they all had some things that held them back from true perfection. And the same goes for Diamond and Pearl. They were certainly good, but the games suffer from those above-mentioned problems, especially the slugs. God, Blissey, just die already. Now, I grew up with both Diamond and Planum and Gen 4 in general, so obviously I have some bias, but my nostalgia for these games comes mostly from just watching my brother play the games, rather than playing them for myself. These games only have one save file, and I didn't want to erase all those 130 plus hours my brother spent on the game. So I tried to play a new game without saving, and that went as well as you probably might think. I never got that far into my adventures in Diamond and Platinum as a kid. No, it wasn't until I discovered the wonderful world of emulation on a smartphone when I truly experienced Sinnoh for myself. And obviously, I loved the journey. I loved building my team, winning all the 8 gym badges, stopping Team Galactic, and facing the Elite Four champion. In fact, I loved it so much after that first playthrough back in 2018, nearly 10 years after I was first introduced to the game, that I played so much Pokemon on my phone. But even in spite of binging all the games from Gens 3 through 8 in the coming years, Planum was the one I kept coming back to the most. So on my fifth or so playthrough of the game, I started to wonder, what does make this game so special? Why do I come back to it year after year? What makes this game so good and the, shall we say, perfect Pokemon experience? Then I realized, hey, I have a proper YouTube channel now. Why not make a video on this very topic? So join me, grab a snack and a drink, as I analyze the various qualities of Pokemon Planum and compare them to its predecessors and other Pokemon games of the same caliber. In this part review, part video essay, part analysis, part gushing video, because this is what makes Pokemon Planum the perfect Pokemon experience. So, Diamond and Pearl weren't exactly huge steps forward for the series, at least in terms of the main game, but they introduced small little updates, such as splitting the moves by physical and special, and being able to encounter wild Pokemon in double battles. Of course, there are bigger changes like the 3D graphics, and how it introduced online to Pokemon which can't really be accessed anymore anyway, so whatever. <coughs> but they were mostly just small but significant stuff. Even then though, there were multiple things that people would see as a step down from the previous generations, such as the frame rate being cut in half and the battles being a abysmally slow, the Sinnoh Pokedex being lacking in some Pokemon, especially fire types, and the story being somewhat basic and really just a repeat of the previous Pokemon stories. Go beat the bad guy and win the Pokemon League. Now when we move on to Planum, oh ho ho, things get a bit more interesting. Planum enhanced the graphics even further so that the game looks even nicer now. 
game was made a bit faster in battle, multiple Pokemon were added to the Sinnoh Pokedex to alleviate the lack of some types, and the story was expanded upon with several new set pieces and designs. These changes and additions made the game so much better. No longer could you make the joke that only one team is viable for Sinnoh runs, and taking out Lissy takes less of an eternity. This is where we get to the stuff I personally love about this game. Prepare for some gushing, excuse me, this is one of my favorite games of all time. So first of all, the expanded Pokemon roster. Holy shit. Over 200 Pokemon are available compared to the measly 150 in DP. And the best part is, nearly all of them are viable for use in the main game. This is thanks to the fact that you have access to more than just their move pool, which are already improved by Gen 4 having introduced several new moves. Many useful TMs are available to you before post-game, as well as two of Blandom's new move tutors. Granted, the third one, which is in post-game, has some good stuff as well, but I never really had a use for them. I could do with the two other tutors just fine. Okay, mainly just one of them, but the expanded roster allowed me to have some fun team combinations. Like take my first three teams, for example. For my first playthrough, I used Torterra, Luxray, Togekiss, Garchomp, Gastrodon, and Hound. For the second, I used Infernape, Alakazam, Vaporeon, Rampardos, Roserade, and Glyson. And for the third, I used Empoleon, Seraptor, Rotom, Magmortar, Toxicroak, and Abomasnow. Three teams comprised of different types of Pokemon, and I was still getting ideas for new team combinations. In fact, on my fifth playthrough, I was still using a completely new team aside from my starter. Not to mention that, while some types had doubling in some instances, each playthrough still had very diverse teams, and also very balanced in terms of physical, special, and mixed attackers. This makes the game supremely replayable for me, and that's why I've come back to it so many times. The pacing and the difficulty curve are also perfect. The game may be more linear than some of the previous entries, but this allowed the difficulty curve to also be more linear, and with this, every trainer you face becomes stronger the further you go through the game, and it's almost always at your level. This means you don't need to grind for levels much, which is a godsend in a turn-based RPG. The linearity also helps with the pacing as you get introduced to new areas and routes at a pretty tight pace. There's just enough trainer battles, just enough to explore, just enough new Pokemon to find as you go along, until the game lets you into a new area. Admittedly, there are some areas of the game that might feel like a slog, but we'll get to that soon. I also have this sense of exploration with this game, more so than with any other Pokemon game, almost like a Metroidvania might have to do with the fact that you have 8 whole HMs, which allow you to do different things in the game world. Now many have pointed to this as the actual biggest problem in the game, because having to design your team around these HMs, which you'll need for progression sometimes, is tedious. Especially because Mount Coronet is full of these HM spots. If you've been a Pokemon fan since the Gen 4 days, you might have heard about the infamy Mount Coronet has gotten for being a slog, especially during the last long visit to it. You need to have all the HMs except for two in order to get everything. But let me just say this, you don't need to do this. Like I said, HMs are only needed sometimes. You don't necessarily need to have all the eight HMs on your team at all times. You just need a few HM slaves in your PC box and use them when it's necessary. Keyword being when it's necessary because you only really need three HMs for Mount Coronet. Surf, Strength, and Rock Climb. That's it. Contrary to popular belief, Rock Smash, Defog, and Waterfall are not required. In fact, I recommend doing two visits to Mount Coronet. One where you get through the game as normal, with minimal HMs, and another with all the HMs because you can't get Waterfall anyway until after the last visit. This goes back to the whole Metroidvania aspect of this game. 
where getting new HMs to use opens up new places to explore, especially when you get surf. That's when the region really opens up. So don't be afraid to backtrack to previous locations, because I dare say it's part of the design. Sure, I won't say the HM system is secretly perfect or anything, but it has a lot more merit than people give it credit for. Except for Default. Fuck Default. And that about wraps it up. Sure, I could go on about the other, smaller things I love, like the sprite work, the region itself, some of the quality of life improvements, and just certain Pokemon from this generation I really love, but I don't want to lengthen this video with small addendums like that. Just know that these are the main reasons I love this game. But what about the other popular Pokemon games that came before and after this game? Why do I put this game on a pedestal in comparison to the other games like Emerald or Black and White or Heart Gold and Soul Silver? Well, there are a few reasons to that, which I want to get into in detail, relating to the things I love about this game in particular. Emerald and by extension the games before it are easy to explain. They haven't aged the best. When playing through the main series, I couldn't really go back further than the third generation because of how dated the two first generations are, both graphically and mechanically, especially Gen 1. I'm sure we all know by now how broken Gen 1 was with how overpowered psychic types were, how the special stat was just one stat, and how the games were full of glitches. And these are just a few examples. Of course, there never was a reason for me to go back to RBY in the first place because there already existed two vastly superior remakes. And the same goes for Gen 2, as Heart Gold and Soul Silver are massive improvements and make the original Game Boy games obsolete. Gen 3 is a bit more trickier to explain, as I have gone back to Emerald at least once, but never to the same caliber as with Planet. Firstly, I feel like the move selection for the Pokemon wasn't really all that great. Sure, there was the move reminder, and some of the TMs were good, but my problem lies with the move pools, and the fact that physical and special were still being tied to types rather than moves. Some Pokemon are just not good to use because of this, I'm looking at you, Mighty Ana, and it just limits the amount of Pokemon you can use if you want a balanced and diverse team. And also, since this is only the third generation of Pokemon, I don't think the roster was as refined as it is in later years. Like, if I were to start a new playthrough of Emerald right now, I'd have a hard time thinking of a new team for it. Some of the Pokemon I just don't want to use because they're better in later generations, especially Gen 4. Like, I don't want to use Magneton, I want to use Magnezone. I don't want to use Dust Cops, I want to use Dust Noir. And I definitely don't want to use Absol, whose attack is better than its special attack, and the Dark type is a special type in Gen 3. You probably get what I mean. And it goes right back to my first problem, too. And yes, I'm aware that a remake of Ruby and Sapphire exists, but I've only played a little bit of Omega Ruby slash Alpha Sapphire at the time of writing this. But I am aware they do fix some of these problems I have, since they are Gen 6 games. But they also have their own problems when compared to Emerald. And Gen 6 Pokemon, I wouldn't really call top tier, but we'll get to that later. Alright, so what about Heart Gold and Soul Silver? The games directly following Planum in release order? These are the games people will race on a pedestal the most, and I, for one, do not agree. Now, Heart Gold and Soul Silver are very good games, but the best Pokemon games? Eh. Yes, these are good, even great games, but I have so many problems with them. Most of my main problems come down to three things the region itself, the selection of Pokemon available, and the difficulty curve, or lack thereof. Johto is kind of a mess. The region is memorable enough, but it's such a slog to go through because of its lack of direction and being so tied to Kanto that it kinda loses some of its own identity. Now what do I mean by lack of direction? Well, Johto has always been praised for its non-linearity, 
because after a certain point, the game stops railroading you and lets you go to some places earlier than intended. In theory, this is a good thing, since this means you can go about your adventure your way, but what it actually does is make the adventure feel more... lacking. This brings us nicely to the difficulty curve complaint, as the open nature of the games means that the level of trainers you encounter stays relatively same for the length of the adventure, meaning less experience, less difficulty, and, because there's a huge jump in levels near the end, more grinding in the end game. Hooray! The level curve in these games is beyond ridiculous, and it just makes the game feel hollow. Like, is there any point to fighting when everyone's this weak? Well, there is, but you get the idea. Then there's the available Pokémon, which I'm also not a big fan of. Yes, there are over 250 Pokémon to choose from. That comes with a big asterisk. So many of the Johto Pokémon are available either very late in the game or in post-game, and that's a big problem. At the start of your journey, you'll encounter mostly Pokémon from the original 151, with the occasional Johto Pokémon thrown in. Now why would I play Heart Gold and Soul Silver when I can use most of these Pokémon in Byron and Leaf Green, or even the Let's Go games? Hell, Platinum has some of these Pokémon as well! Not to mention that this game still has HMs, and one of them is Whirlpool! Game Freak really said, what if we made Defog 2? Fuck that! Well, technically, this came before Defog because Whirlpool was in the original games as well, combined with the fact that Johto is very stingy with good TMs, and that the Moog Tutors are pretty much all in the post-game, something else that the Kanto games have over this one, getting a good and diverse moveset for your team is an actual pain in the ass. And this just might be the biggest problem with HGSS in general. The game is way too focused on post-game. I mean, think about it. All the good stuff is in Kanto. Some of the Johto Pokémon can only be found in Kanto. Most of the good TMs only in Kanto. I have never understood why this game is put on a pedestal because of its post-game. Sure, it's more stuff to do, but when the core adventure in Johto is so unfulfilling, the postgame just feels like a consolation prize of sorts. Now, don't get me wrong, I still really like Heart Gold and Soul Silver. It has great vibes, Gen 2 has some great Pokémon, and the UI is fantastic, for instance. And it's still a Gen 4 game at heart, so of course I'm inclined to have a little bit of love towards it. But when I compare it to Platinum, which I've played several times compared to my one playthrough of Heart Gold, where I couldn't even be bothered to finish the post-game, I think I see a clear winner here. Planum has the better level curve, region, and Pokemon selection, something that HGSS can't really outreach. Other than HGSS, we also have to look at games that came after Gen 4, since those should be an improvement over the previous generation. And in some aspects, they certainly are. I mean, let's look at Planum's and HGSS's immediate successor, Black and White. Much faster gameplay, better sprite work and graphics in general, better story, hell, better region some might say, everything seems to be better. And yes, Black and White are certainly great games. However, the Pokémon selection is what really holds them back from true greatness. These games did something that was very controversial back in the day, which was to limit the Pokémon you get in the main game to only the new 5th generation Pokémon. And while this is great on a first playthrough, with discovering completely new Pokémon for the first time and using them in your team, the subsequent playthroughs really suffer from it. And while there are over 150 choices, it suffers from the same problem as the Kanto game. As in, there are literally no other options. But then came a savior. In 2012, Game Freak decided to release this beautiful game on store shelves. The first direct sequel in the series, Black and White 2. And this game, oh man, this game is amazing. The new Pokémon return, of course, but now with some of the old Pokémon as well. More quality of life improvements. More content than ever before! This game is just... 
I can't pull though this greatness. Also, this game makes HGSS even more obsolete by having some of the Johto Pokemon, but shh. Now, this was very close to taking the top spot of the Pokemon for me. However, there were a few things that make it only my second favorite Pokemon. And as unfortunate as it sounds, it's because of the first game. What do I mean by this? Well, as BW2's role as a sequel, it kinda goes hand in hand with the first BW. As in, they're not really a complete experience without each other. Sure, you could play BW2 without having played the first one and have a grand old time, but then if you go back and play BW1 later, your experience is gonna be neutered because the sequel feels better to play. The story also isn't as good as the first games. The first Black and White had the mystery surrounding Team Plasma and their goals, and the moral dilemma of keeping Pokémon in the first place whereas the second game's story is more of a basic Pokemon plot, and that's kinda disappointing. But the connections to the first game and how it builds upon it are the most interesting aspects of the story. But my biggest, well, not really a problem per se, but more like a dilemma I have, is that I don't actually know what Pokemon to use in BW1 when I also want to use them in BW2. The thing is, I always try my best to use Pokemon I've never used before in a playthrough of a Pokemon game, and that goes for both of these games as well. And that makes playthroughs of BW1 especially pretty difficult, because I want to use a whole new team of new Pokemon. To see where I'm going with this, I want my playthroughs of both BW1 and 2 to have different teams. But I also want to use the Gen 5 Pokemon in both games, and that's difficult to do occasionally. In Platinum, I have an easier time dreaming up team combinations, because it's the only Gen 4 game in Sinnoh that I want to play, while my options in the black and white games are a bit more limited. Who knows, maybe my feelings will change over time, and this video will be outdated in like 3 years, but right now, that's how I feel. And lastly, the newer Pokemon games. What about them? Why aren't they competing with Platinum? Well, from the gens 6 through 8, I played X and Y, Sun and Moon, and Sword and Shield. X and Y were the first mainline games in 3D, and Switch was the mainline series debut on a home console, which both show in some places. These games, while definitely fun, didn't really reach the highs of the previous entries. X and Y's story was interesting, and I found most of the characters in those games to be pretty lame. The games really leaned heavily on that Gen 1 fan service. there weren't as many new Pokemon as the previous generations, and the new Mega Evolutions were busted as all hell. Swish, on the other hand, had great characters, but a very basic story, and the games in general weren't that big of a step forward from the 3DS. Then what about Sun and Moon? Honestly, I may need to think about this one. Now, some of the game's parts drag a bit, but this is a solid entry in the series. There are a bit more new Pokémon than X and Y, these games introduced the regional variants, and made some things to shake up the formula. It didn't really grab me as much as my favorites did, though, so I may need to mull it over just a little bit before I start calling it one of the greats. And that's basically all I have to say. Look, I'm really sorry if this came off as a way to shit-talk other Pokemon games in comparison to Platinum, but as a whole, I still love this entire franchise. And sure, you can say nostalgia had a part in why Platinum is my favorite, since I grew up with it, but that's really just how I feel. I genuinely think Platinum is the ultimate experience of Pokemon, and that it could cater to every kind of Pokemon fan. Unless you play these games for fast turn-based battles, then this game might not be for you. I know this video probably won't convince people that aren't already fans to consider trying this game out, because at the end of the day, it's still the same old Pokemon on the surface level. But while Platinum might not be the best and perfect gaming experience as a whole, I feel it's the perfect experience of the Pokemon franchise. You can experience discovery, adventure, and victory on this one journey, and at the end of the day, that's what makes it one of my favorite games of all time.
time. But what do you think? Am I full of shit after all? Be sure to tell me all about my mistakes on the Pokemon formula in the comments below or on the side of the video player or wherever Google has put it. The Pokemon fanbase may be toxic, but I'm not, I think. Please God, don't let this age badly. But until next time, like, comment, and subscribe. This has been Dragon Guy, signing off.